So that then begs the question, if he cannot go, what changes come to the offense based off either things that Marcus Mariota likes versus the things that Jaden Daniels likes, the things that they don't like, and just the, I'm going to use the word drop off because otherwise Marcus would be the starter, the drop off from Jaden to Marcus. Like what changes in this offense in terms of how it's called, how it's designed, or just how it functions with the, the backup under center? Yeah, so I think the first thing is I'd probably just uh, be Rob Austin Eckler or Jeremy McNichols, the offensive line. I'd really lean into that group, and they've done a great job throughout the season. I think it's a group that's shown you can lean on them, and I think with the right schematic elevation, like we talked about in the podcast on Tuesday, we're insulating runs, we're putting window dressing on certain runs, we're getting to runs in different formations, we're spreading guys out to run downhill, like all that stuff. I'm leaning into that 100%. I'm also leaning into the quarterback run stuff, and not because I think it's going to be like overly effective or anything like that. I just think it helps kind of settle him in. Like when you watch mm-hmm. him in Atlanta, when you watch him in Tennessee, he's a guy that, you know, I think takes a little bit of time to kind of get in the flow of the game. And that's just an easy way for him to like get on base, like kind of get in the tempo, get in the speed of the game. So I'd probably look for something like that early. And the other thing I noticed uh, just in watching the game and kind of comparing it to what they did in Atlanta, he's not a super like on rhythm thrower and like it's kind of a it's a really interesting juxtaposition to Jaden who's very on rhythm very on time you know like really high levels of anticipation it's not like that so I'm kind of thinking of throws where as Cliff Kingsbury I can create a lot of space for him to kind of see throws and kind of looking back and watching the film like that's what they did they didn't like lean into quick game which is kind of what your default setting would be if you're trying to get a quarterback easy throws. You're like, let's get into quick game. Let's get into stuff where he can just get the ball out quick and get run some. It's not that it's kind of these deeper, longer developing play action shots. And those play action shots, I think are so important because they, they create grass for him. And again, it, right. that if you're going to do that, you got to think about when I'm going to do that, like situation in the game, how I'm going to protect it. And that's something that I think Cliff's done a great job of this season. So as opposed I, I think, to saying, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, the thing is, too, on those play action shots, like the vertical route often isn't open because teams cover it. And it's like, oh, God, that guy's going deep. But the, when you talk about the grass that it opens up, it then becomes yeah. the easy throws underneath it. And a lot of times you can get the, like that high cross intermediate stuff where mm-hmm. it's like really, really easy to see because all the, the deeper defenders have gone with some kind of vertical route or just the easy, if you want easy check downs underneath. I just wanted to kind of, you know, Un, unlayer one more layer of the onion there for folks on how that creates the space because like just sending everybody deep isn't the answer it's what you do underneath it that then creates the easy throws for a guy like Mariota to really be able to see it and those tend to be wide open and although not maybe 50 or touchdowns you can get 10 15 yards pretty easily on some of those plays if the blocking holds up yeah, and I think that's that's a that's a really nice way to articulate it. You're not taking like you're not trying to hit a post. You're trying to hit the crosser, basically, or the, right. or the big out, or the or Zach Ertz over the middle of the field, kind of crossing into that window because you've cleared it out. So I think that's what I'd kind of expect to see. Which is which is, I think he did one of the reasons he did so well. I think the other thing that I'd like to see Cliff do, and he's done it with every quarterback he's ever had, is get into those three by ones, find those isolations. Those are really easy reads and really easy decisions for the quarterback, especially when you got a guy like Terry who's good at running hitches. He's good at running comebacks. You know, he's not Terry doesn't have the most diverse route tree of all time, but he's really good at those. So I'm gonna lean into those and just make sure he's he's feeling comfortable and gets on base. But I think because he's a little bit of out of rhythm thrower, or that's what he showed last game, and that's what he showed when he was in Atlanta too. Um what is my protection plan? I think it's going to be the big thing for him, especially with the Bears. And it's good this week because the Bears aren't, you know, we'll talk about that more in a second, more specifically, but they don't bring a ton of pressure. They're kind of like, we're going to, in some ways, they're kind of a vanilla defense. They're like, we're going to win with four. Sometimes we'll be, bring five if the situation dictates, but we're not, it's not like when you watch Minnesota where you're like, what are they doing? There's so many rushers. <laughs> this is simulated pressures. Like there's just right. so much going on. They're not like that. So I, it, it, in terms of production plan, I think Cliff will be able to come up with a good one. And I think, again, you don't want to leverage these kind of down the field throws too much. And so that's where I think the running game is going to be really nice to insulate them. But again, like, to Mariota's credit, he this is the, a style very similar to the offense that he ran when he was at Oregon. He does seem very comfortable with it. He's very comfortable with kind of the number counts, the quarterback run stuff. So I do think I think there there will be a drop off, but I think Cliff, if he calls a good game, which he's done throughout the year, can really insulate him. So 
For sure. Um, just to wrap up on Marcus, and then I do want to talk a little bit more, obviously, about the Chicago defense specifically, but also why they've given up a ton of big runs this year, uh, because that could be huge in this game. The thing that concerns me with the drop off is I've been using, I, I've now had to answer this question multiple times on a couple of different things, and I've been borrowing a word from you, Logan. Jaden is so fastidious with the football. He has <laughs> pr protected the football so well this year. And Marcus yeah. has had some spurts in his career where that has not been the case. And the Bears are a very, very good team at forcing turnovers. They have a ton of interceptions this year. They've got some fumbles. Like They, they might be vanilla, but they will get after you. Yeah. And the commanders probably are not going to win this game if they lose the turnover battle. And so can Marcus protect the football in the way that Jaden has protected the football, even if that means Tressway has his busiest day of the year so far as he's had a famously low number of punts this season. That's fine, but it's kind of one of those games where every series needs to end with a kick. And if you can do that and then steal one or two off of Caleb the other way, then you're in business in this game, even if you don't have the big explosive stuff that you might get from Jaden. But I do think that the running game can have some big explosive plays. Um, I was watching all the, you know, one of the things I do when I watch tape on on an opponent, which again is getting harder and harder by the week. There's they, apparently they keep playing games around the rest I of the know. league too, Logan. It's like, man, there's a lot of film here. This was easy in week two, uh, but you're you're watching. Uh, I watch all the times that teams have scored on a team. Like where are the touchdowns coming from? And for some teams, it's like. One, run from the two, run from the two, run from the one, run from the four. And it's like, okay, you kind of have to drive it on this team. The Bears have given up three or four at least big, like 38, 32, yeah. 31 yard touchdown runs this year. How are teams able to get them in the run game with the big explosives? And uh, if you're Cliff Kingsbury, how excited are you by the fact that other teams have already done the thing that you strive to do week in and week out? Yeah, and so when you watch the Bears, like I, I, I do it a little bit differently. I watch all the first downs, then I watch all the for usually first and second down, then I watch all the third downs and kind of go through it like that, just to kind of get a feel for tendency, right? Like what yeah. they want to be doing on first. That's down. That's where I start too, but eventually yeah. I'm like, let's get to the fun stuff. You yeah, know? it is. It is more fun to watch touchdowns for sure. And I think the thing I left with is they they want to play cover three a lot or single high safety, whether you know whatever it is, whether it's man cover three whether it's like uh, man lurk, man plug, whatever it is, they're in some type of single high structure. And there's eight guys in the box. Like uh, Jaquan Brisker for them is is very, very good. He's very physical. He's downhill. He plays with good energy. He's a lot of fun to watch. And so when you're playing eight-man box, like it should be really hard to run the football. Like think old Seattle cover three. Like that's why they ran that structure is to basically like you're not going to run the football anymore. And so I was surprised that there's all these kind of explosive runs in the against them. And when you watch the explosive runs, I think the thing that jumps out to me is while they're in an eight-man box, they are a very fast and aggressive defense, and they do get a little bit undisciplined is probably the wrong word, but they do get out of gaps. So, for example, uh, there was a run that the Panthers ran where it was like – I think it was a – an explosive touchdown run. I don't know if it's a touchdown, but maybe they've done it like the two yard line. It was a 50 yard run. And there's like a little jet sweep action. The quarterback boots out the three technique gap releases. Jaquan Brisker is supposed to fit off of that, but he plays the jet sweep and there's a lane that's absolutely gigantic. So I think they just don't have great eye discipline all the time. And it shows up in these explosive runs because you're in that structure to stop the run. And so when they don't do it, you're like, Oh, they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. And you see why. And again, they're, their kind of best asset is that they're fast to the football, uh, but it's also something you can use against them. And it, teams have, have, have exploited that. Like the Panthers absolutely got after them in the run game. And again, they have a really good interior. They're very physical up front, like we talked about when we were previewing Carolina. But I was surprised how efficient their run game was. And again, they, they lose that game for exactly the point you're talking about. Um, you know, Andy Dalton throws two picks and they, I think they lost two fumbles in that game to Chicago. So they're, the ball is life for Chicago big time. But in terms of running the football, I think it fits really, really well, at least in that game and against Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a little bit different. Their explosive runs come predominantly off of like quarterback reads, scrambles. There's a couple that Swift has that are explosive runs. I'm talking about Chicago's offense now, but for yep. Jacksonville, uh, obviously the same type of thing. Just a little bit of window dressing, a little bit of number count. You'll be okay. But um, I, I, do, I do think that it fits with what Cliff and what this offense has done throughout the year, where it's like, hey, a little bit of window dressing, number counts. Let's, let's take advantage of it. So... I do think that's going to be a huge feature in this game, no doubt. 
Yeah. So looking at some of the statistical side of this. Also, by the way, just real quick before I forget, the 38-yard Chuba Hubbard run that for the touchdown on Chicago or against Chicago by Carolina. Did you see Robert Hunt on that play? No. Guard? What happened? Uh, it was like a GT pull, and mm -hmm. Hunt goes, pulls, hits his block. And then he starts like shoulder shimmy dancing <laughs> as Hubbard gets to like the 20 yard line because he's like, oh, it got out. It's worked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I just have never seen an offensive lineman start dancing that early. So that was fun. <laughs> uh, if you want, you want some really fun one, go watch the long Chuba Hubbard touchdown run on the all 22 end zone angle. Um, anyway, look at some of the stats on Chicago's run defense. They are actually right next to Washington. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of statistical categories. Um, they are now the 12th best in the league EPA per rush. Um, but one thing that I think is interesting is they have a fairly low stuff percentage, yeah. um, which we've talked about a little bit this year. They are have the ninth lowest stuff percentage in the league. And the reason I think that's important is like you're not necessarily at huge, huge risk of getting in second and 12. Right. If you run the football, can you at least get yeah. two, three yards out of it and stay on good down and distance, which I think is going to be really important with Mariota because the idea of him having to drop back and just play, you know, super high leverage quarterback is is not where he's going to shine. So I think that is something that is encouraging uh, against the Bears defense. That is one of the best in the league. They are also, I'd imagine, I haven't looked at the red zone numbers. They've got to be outstanding in the red zone because they are giving up like 16 points per game. They're one of the mm. best um, in the league in terms of scoring, which ultimately is the whole point of defense. And they also have not given up over 21 points in 12 straight games. So you might be able to get some explosive runs. You might be able to get this, get that. But the reason that that they are tremendous in terms of scoring is they are one of the top like three, four in almost every statistical category against the pass. Yeah. They are really hard to pass against. And I'm guessing that has to do with the talent in their secondary, as well as a couple of good pass rushers and and actually a pretty solid second level as well. Yeah, and this is one of those things too where I think they've got they've got the benefit of scheduling a little bit and you, you gotta play and take the test that's given to you. But they got the Tennessee Titans week one. They got the Texans, obviously, that's a very prolific offense. And and I think they gave up 35 points in that game, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And then they got the Colts with uh, Anthony Richardson, and that game was tough to watch, man. Like, they, no one wanted to win. They're throwing picks. We're not being careful with the football. Just not very good offense in general. The Rams are banged up. They got them week four. The Panthers, who we just saw, and we just talked about how rough they can be offensively. And then the Jacksonville Jaguars, who, again, in that game in London were just not very efficient offensively so it's funny like when you watch some of the cut-ups some like the completion cut-ups like there's space and there's air in the defense i think it's just about like can you maximize the can you can you be effective can you maximize because i like they're talented but there's nobody that you're like oh my god this guy there's no sauce gardener in the secondary i, I was gonna say uh, Jalen johnson's kind of emerged as one of those guys he's a good like, player he he might be a top five corner in the league at this point he, like, and he's so, been Awesome. Again, good players, but I also think there's some context to the numbers they have, to their defensive efficiency numbers in terms of scoring. And, uh, you know, we're coming in and our starting quarterback Mac may or may not play. But if you can kind of protect the football, run the ball, hit some explosive plays, like just, I know that's kind of day one offensive stuff. They're, they're not, there's sometimes when you watch a defense and you're like, I don't know how we're going to put up points. And I, this is a good group. They're a physical group. They run hard. They're, they've got a bunch of athletes. I think when you look at their depth chart, you know, they've got good linebackers. TJ Edwards, a guy they paid a lot of money to in free agency, a linebacker. They got Tremaine Edmonds. They brought him in from Buffalo. Montez Sweat. Gervin Dexter's their sack leader at defensive tackle. They've got players. I'm not saying they don't have players. Yeah. It's just there's sometimes like when you used to watch like Baltimore, you know, back in the day or San Francisco, like back in 2013, 14, when they had Patrick Willis at linebacker, you're just like, what are we going to do? And that's not exactly how you feel about this group. So I do think, I think they're good. I think they're slightly inflated by the offensive talent that they've sure. seen so far this year. Sure. Um, all right. So at the end of the day, like if you're Cliff and you're managing Marcus, um, what are the, what's like your final word to him as you send him out there? Hey man, go get him And remember, yeah, I, I, this is always tough. Like when you're talking to a quarterback and it's like anytime you're coaching anybody, it's tough because sometimes you say, hey, let's make sure we protect the football. And then they're thinking about it too much and they play right. too conservative. So hey man, for, go let it rip. Yeah. So I'd probably say something like that. I was like, hey, man, we trust you. Make a decision. Let's get after it. And then it's my job as a quarterback coach or as the offensive coordinator, excuse me, to make sure that 
I don't put him in bad spots, right? My, like we just talked about, what is my protection plan? And the other thing is like, if we're efficient on first and second down, he's not going to be in these crazy high leverage third downs. Like sometimes I'm t- like when you're watching another team's offense, like Carolina is a really good example of this. When they're not efficient on first and second down, they're in third and 10. And everyone's like, oh, Andy Dalton, he's struggling, whatever. But that third and 10 is like the most high leverage passing situation. You're going to get a great rush. You're going to get a great pressure. They, they're they going to be awesome in coverage in the back end. And you're going to have to deal. So what is my plan on first and second down to limit the exposure to that in those in in those tough passing downs? And one of the things about this offense so far this year is it's been excellent. It's really been excellent about staying out of those situations. And a lot of that... I give credit to Jaden Daniels because he just makes excellent decisions. But as Cliff, can I help facilitate that a little bit to his skill set like we talked about? More quarterback runs potentially, more kind of screens, quick game. Cliff loves that stuff. They've been ex- excellent at executing that all year. And then when we've got to have it, got to have those big chunk plays, can we do it from a third and four as opposed to a third and 10 or third and eight where it's right. a little bit more obvious passing down? One thing that I will say for both coordinators, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we flip sides of the ball here, is when they have gone against coordinators that are kind of predictable, they can really get on one. They can Mm. get on heaters as play callers. Joe has done that sometimes this year. When he figures out an offense's rhythm, like he's on it. And Cliff, I think the same. And so the fact that this defense is vanilla could be something where Cliff sets up you know, Marcus really nicely for success, but also Chicago is vanilla because they're good enough to get away with being vanilla in a lot of ways. So you still got to go out and execute. Other last thing real quick is they've got some nice speed on the edge uh, in terms like Montez specifically. Um, I think I think folks are fairly familiar with his stylings. So I do wonder the quarterback run game, what kind of wrinkles they have to not let him play both on the basic zone read stuff um, because he's one of the few defensive ends in the league that can get away with playing both. And so how do they how do they do that to try to keep that a part of the the plan because obviously running Marcus, if you're not running him, like you're not maximizing him, you're not even close. So that's that's another like specific wrinkle that I'm kind of thinking about going into this one. And I think Marcus is excellent at it. Like in excellent at it in terms of he makes good decisions, but he's also great with the ball in in a yeah. way that a lot of quarterbacks aren't. So like when I remember watching again, obviously when this team uh when when the commanders played Atlanta last year and he was the quarterback, just his ability on the zone read to just it look just extend that fake and put that defensive end in just a little bit more conflict. And so you can tell, like, obviously the commanders knew what what they were gonna do and they coached him up to kind of surf the surf the handoff, play that surf technique. But because the handoff's so long, guys would get they they'd get, you know, kind of in bad spots. So I think that's another thing he just does a great job of. And um and you mentioned the uh the simplicity of the Bears defense. And it it is true. Like first down, they're gonna be in some type of single high, usually. And then on second and third down, or second and long, third and long, they're gonna be in some type of split safety structure, Tampa two, you know, some type of cover two, maybe quarters. And you can play, you can as an offensive coordinator, that's great. The problem is like they know when they play a defense a lot, they play a lot of cover three, they play a lot of cover two, they know where the soft spots are. So they're going to be really acutely aware of the stuff that hurts them. And as a result, they're able to cover it up. So it's going to be a really interesting chess match between Cliff and their defensive coordinator um, in terms of what they can do to to kind of maximize each side of the football. And in Cliff's case, if, if Marcus does play, how do you maximize Marcus? 